True change is comprised of three factors, knowledge, passion, and action. Today we saw the passion and the action as we witness the outrage that people have over the dismantling of California's educational system. We saw action when people rallied, held press conferences, disaster drills, sent letters to, let to representatives and politicians, called their neighbors, took all measures and steps to raise awareness of the plight of California's educational system. But behind all this, there has to be an intellectual foundation, a strong knowledge base. And that's what we're gaining today from the teach-in session here at the Elihu M. Harris State Building in downtown Oakland. Next, you're about to witness a presentation from Jonathan Kaplan of the California Budget Project, one of the state's foremost experts not only on the California budget, but on its specific impact on education. Please just take a few minutes to listen to what Jonathan has to say. I promise you, you'll walk away with a better understanding of California's budget, its impact on schools, and the way it affects everyday life in this state. The honor of introducing Mayor Jean Kwan, um, who is an education mayor, and we're going to hold her to that. So um, we're really happy that she was able to come. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. Now, I sent Lewis. So Lewis already told you everything um, that I've been saying around the state that um, it's a shame that they're pitting education against the needs, other needs of cities, and that um, we really have to change the paradigm and so I'm sure I asked Lewis to make sure that that we talk about those oil extraction taxes and the fact that the prison guards union and the prisons have have grown now to 11 percent of the budget when Jerry Brown was governor the first time they were only three percent of the budget so we've really got to change funding and not sort of pit poor people against poor people and um, I want to say that I'm trying to do my best to be supportive of the school district and of the teachers. Um, we had an amazing series of joint cabinet meetings of city staff and school staff, and we're going to do some things, I hope, um, that in, in about a month that, that we're going to start opening up some of our school gyms and our park and rec centers and our, our library at 81st Ave late on Friday and Saturday nights so that kids in the areas where there's the most violence will have safe places to be. So that's an amazing thing that we can do without any extra money, but the things that we, just by thinking about our kids more and more, um, I've been working really hard with, with the superintendent to get the clinics and other services on the campus. I think you're going to find us sharing facilities and, um, and working together more and more to, to help the kids in the city. Um, I, pledged to help the superintendent to change well, I think it's a disgrace for Oakland, a disgrace for the nation that only 30% of our African-American kids are graduating from high school and that um, we can do better as a city and that we need to make that not an issue just for the schools, but an issue for the entire city. And um, my daughter is working on Sandra Swanson's bill to try to get money back from the state that they misspent. So, um, she, he stole her from my campaign. I stole one of his people from his campaign. She works for me. So both Skyline grads, both smart young women. Um, so we're working on all of those issues. But uh, we really have to tell Sacramento that they can't continue uh, to ignore uh, the corporate profits in oil and the amount of money we're spending in prisons and then try to cut whether it's redevelopment services or senior services or school services at, at our expense. So thank you very much for doing this. I'm sorry it rained on you. I'm sorry I was late. I had another meeting. I have to go to yet another meeting, but uh, it's good to see you all. Thank you. So just for the benefit of our next speaker who doesn't know all of you the way um, Betty and I do. How many of you are teachers? Great. How many of you are principals? Great. Woo. How many of you uh, have other jobs in OUSD? Great. How many of you are students? All right. How many of you are members of the community? Oh, this is really good. This is really good. So I want to thank you all for coming out. This is the first time we've tried a teach-in like this. It's something I've wanted to do uh, for a couple of years, ever since I first learned that 80% of our unrestricted fund comes from Sacramento. 
Let me say that again, 80% of the money that we can use for any purpose comes from Sacramento. That's why we care so much about what happens in Sacramento. And I mean, there's a lot of reasons to care, but for me, that's a really big one. I've wanted to do a teaching like this. Um, it has been a real pleasure to work with Betty Olson Jones from the OEA and uh, other, our other unions and our, our OUSD staff. I want to recognize before I forget Troy Flint and Sally Nadal Hayes in particular, who've been tremendous during this effort. And I want to, um, at this point, just tell you the agenda for today is we're going to hear from Jonathan Kaplan with the California Budget Project. He's going to give us the big picture. We're going to, in between, we'll have some opportunities for you to, to talk to your neighbors a little bit about what you're hearing. We're going to break it down some more. We have Vernon Howell, who's our Deputy Superintendent for Business, who has done an amazing job in helping me and many others of, of, uh, uh, throughout the city uh, learn how the budgets really work and, and bring it down local. Then we're going to hear from our student director, Lachey Robinson. She's um, going to be a great resource for you to talk about how, what it means for kids. And then we're going to close it out with Jack Gerson, one of our veteran teachers, talking about how it happens in the classroom. Before I forget, I want to recognize, if he's still here, uh, Director Chris Dobbins is here. Chris, where are you? He just stepped outside. He'll come back in. He represents District 6, and I'm really pleased he could be here. Noel Gallo and, and David Kakishiba were at the press conference. They were a little shy about coming up front. At this point, I want to turn it over to Jonathan Kaplan. Please give him your attention. Uh, we're going to try to keep these presentations um, as brief as we can, but there's a lot of information we want to share with you, and I want you to think about how can you use this information? How can you take it back to your community and really disseminate it more broadly? And please send us feedback on how we can do this better and different next time. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, my name is as, uh, Jonathan Kaplan. I'm a policy analyst at the California Budget Project. Uh, for those of you who don't know who or what the California Budget Project is, we are an independent nonprofit organization located in Sacramento. We focus on analyzing budget issues from the perspective of middle and low income Californians. Um, and we are separate from the state government. We, we are there to sort of provide independent information for the body politic out there so that you guys can make decisions based on uh, reasonable and informed information. Um, what I'm going to be, uh, so my expertise, I'm a, uh, I have been at the Budget Project for four years. I focus on K-12 and higher education issues. Um, prior to being a policy analyst at the Budget Project, I was a high school social science teacher for eight years in uh, Martinez, California. Um, so I um, feel very lucky to be in front of a bunch of educators and people who work in school districts, parents and students. Um, it's, a, it's an honor for me to be able to do this. Um, and uh, if you want to get in touch with me after the presentation, you can find me through the Budget Project's website, which is up on this title slide, which I think some of you have out in front of you. Uh, it's www.cbp.org. There are also sign-up cards over here to get on our, on our uh, newsletter and email updates. Um, and uh, so the, the, the updates uh, you can get by just simply signing your name. We will not trade your names uh, on uh, email, et, et cetera. Um, and we just are trying to get information out to the public. And this presentation will be up on the Oakland Unified School District website if you want to find it afterwards. And the OEA, and the OEA website as well. Um, so what I'm doing here today um, is to try to give you a basic primer about how the state funds schools in an attempt to try and explain to you why it is that the state's budget crises affect schools. So why is it that the ongoing budget issues in Sacramento continually affect schools? And the governor, then I'm also going to be talking to you just a little bit about the governor's budget proposal, what's on the table right now, and ultimately at the end give you a sense about how you can act to try and affect what's going on in terms of what's happening in Sacramento. So being the teacher I am, uh, I'm going to do a quick quiz. I know some of you might have actually already looked at this already, but it's just a quick way to get you involved in the process. What I'd like you to do is just answer this following one question. Um, which of the following represents the most spending in the California state budget? Would it be? And don't talk, don't talk to your neighbor. No cheating. I'm not going not to grade you on this quiz, but try to do it, number, try to do it on your own. It's health and human services would be number one. Number two? Prisons and corrections, number three, K-12 public education, and number th four, higher education. So take a second, just think about it for a moment. Okay, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but I'm just, uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to let you know, well, I, well let's, let's try it. How many people said health and human services? How many people said prisons and corrections? How many people said K-12 education? And how many people said higher education? 
you actually did well better than most of the people in the state of California. This was a question that was asked in a Public Policy Institute of California poll in January of this year. It was also asked in January of last year. The result of the poll is that about 16% of the state's population answered that question correctly, which is K-12 education is the largest percentage of spending on the state, in terms of state spending, on, um, in terms of what the state spends its money on. Um, about a third of the population answered the question about revenues, that is the personal income tax is the number one provider of funds to the state, but only one in 20 people in the state of California, that 6% of the population answered that question, both of those questions correctly. So what that means for us uh, up in budget land as a policy analyst is that we have a tremendous lack of information in terms of what the public understands about how the state collects its money and how it spends its money. And it's very important that we all are on the same page and understand some basic facts about how the state divides its money. So here's a pie chart to explain what that looks like. The number one portion of the state budget in terms of spending goes to K-12 education. It's 42% of state spending, more or less. Next after that is Health and Human Services. It's about one in every four dollars that are spent. This is mostly on the CalWORKs and Medi-Cal programs that serve low-income Californians. Um, it is sort of called the social safety net of sorts. Then after that is higher education. And after that last is corrections and rehabilitation. So, there, is a pot, there's, there are various myths that we try to, we try to work through at the Budget Trader Project to explain to people how it is that the state spends its money. The number one portion of state spending goes to schools. Okay? Now, from a school district's perspective, the schools that are receiving money in the state, this, and it's Oakland Unified is more or less the same here, it's a little bit different, but these are uh, state aggregate, schools receive more than half of their dollars, 60% more or less, from the state government. So there's about 10% of the dollars come from the federal government and about, roughly speaking, a third of dollars, I'm sorry, 20%, roughly about one in five dollars come from local property taxes. Now, what I've just explained to you really is the nexus is, is why it is that schools are in the crosshairs during state budget crises. If the state spends 40% of its dollars, the largest share, on schools, and schools depend on more than half of their dollars from the state, if the state's going through a budget crisis and needs to find dollars, and they start finding dollars in the place where it is, you know the Willie Sutton quote, why did he rob banks? That's where the money is. Well, the, ra the reality is in state, state land, they go to places where money's being spent. That's K-12 education. And if they cut K-12 education, that means that school districts across the state are going to feel the pain because they get more than half of their dollars from the state. Now, in terms of how the dollars then at the district level, what does the district do with the dollars they receive? More than four out of every five dollars, 80% or more, goes to the salaries and benefits of employees in the district. So... What you are looking at in, at a district level is if there is a cut to schools, you are going to feel it as an employee of a district, whether it be a teacher, an administrator, a, a classified employee, a secretary, a librarian, a counselor, it doesn't matter. What ends up happening is the budget cuts that come down from Sacramento will affect what's happening in terms of what happens in schools and school employees. Now, this is not the way it always has been in the state of California. This is a historical line to look at what the divide is between state, local, and federal dollars over the last 40 years. What you'll notice is that there was a big switch, roughly speaking, in about 1978. That's when Prop 13 passed in the state of California. It used to be, prior to the passage of Prop 13, that the state provided, roughly speaking, oh, about uh, 30 to 40 percent of state spending on schools. After Prop 13, it switched to the state providing around 60% of state funding for schools. Um, so the reason that, it, now there's, there's lots more complex information as to why that switch happened, but what the reality is is the state is the primary funding source for schools and it, it was a major change from 19, the early 1970s to today. You should also know that prior to 1978, California ranked fairly well as relates to other schools states in the nation in terms of its spending on schools. After 1978, that changed quite a bit. Now, I'm going to switch on you. I've got about 20 minutes here. It's usually about half of what I used to get when I was in the classroom, so I'm, trying to, I'm rushing through a lot of information with you. But what I'm going to try to give you is a basic information here about how the, what the governor's budget proposal is, what does it mean for schools. The governor, that's Governor Jerry Brown, 
<clears throat> excuse me, presented a very um, transparent and harsh budget, but it was a refreshing budget for many of us in the Capitol because it was an honest budget. It ex it's, he is attempting to explain to the body politic in this state that there is a major problem going on as relates to spending and revenues. And what he did was he said, he split the difference. He said, we have a, about a $25 billion problem. We're going to take half from spending, half from revenues. Now, the revenue portion of this, though, is dependent on a tax package that he is trying to get on the ballot. The Republicans in the state legislature are, are opposing him, but it is likely, you know, there's a good chance this thing's going to end up on the ballot in June. And that ballot initiative is very important for not just the state as a whole, but for schools in particular. Now, the governor's budget proposal is as follows. The top of this chart shows what, the gov what would happen if the governor's budget proposal were accepted en masse. That is, the entire thing was accepted. And what we see is that we'd have budget surplus, we'd have a balanced budget moving forward for the next four years. If the governor's that package is not passed and we were to operate under current law for the next four years, you're looking at the bottom of this chart. And what that shows is what we are looking at in terms of a structural budget deficit for the next four years. It's between about 17 and $20 billion that we are off. That means more spending of $20 billion or more or less than revenue. Now, to give you, that's a very big number. To give you a sense of what that means, $20 billion is roughly about a fourth of our spending. If you had to get $20 billion just out of spending, well, if you took the state of California and you said we're no longer going to be in the business of higher education, that means we eliminated the University of California, the California State University, and community colleges. Just got the business state out of the business of doing those things. We would only get halfway there. If you then add on top of it the state getting out of the business of corrections, that means releasing 170,000 prisoners that are in state prisons, getting rid of all the parolees, and just saying we're no longer going to be dealing with this thing called corrections, then we'd be just at about 20 billion. This is a very large problem that we're dealing with here. It is a dramatic thing to have to try and deal with this large problem. And the governor has basically said, well, I have a plan. The plan is to try and go through by doing, here his, his plan basically is this. We'll take half in spending, half in revenue. The half in spending I'm gonna to talk to you about in a little bit, that's the right side of your pie chart there. The left side is the revenue portion. Now, one of the things about the revenue portion is, is that you'll notice in this pie chart, these are temporary measures. All he's talking about doing is extending taxes that we already pay for the next four years. After that, those taxes would expire. What happens after 2014-15, he hasn't explained, but what he's trying to do is to move us further down the path so that we hopefully will have an economy that will help us out moving forward. Now, this pie chart takes the expenditure solutions and it blows it up and says, how much, where is the spending portion of the governor's solutions coming from? The governor is proposing half of the spending cuts from Health and Human Services. This is mostly CalWORKs and Medi-Cal. $1.7 billion out of Cal, Medi-Cal and $1.5 billion out of CalWORKs. These are draconian cuts to the neediest people in our state, right? But these, th there are difficult questions about how you're going to get that much money that I was explaining to you you have to get. The governor's proposal is as such. There is also two other portions of the proposal that are very large. One is about a billion dollar cut from higher education, 500 million from the UC, 500 million from the CSU, about a 400 million cut from the California community colleges. And then there is a major and bold proposal about redevelopment agencies, which Mayor Kwan mentioned earlier, which is a very important proposal, especially for schools. I'll talk to you about that briefly at the end of the presentation. What does this mean for schools? What is the governor proposing for K-12 education? Well, when we talk in budget land, this is the current year. That's the year we're in now, between June, July 1st and June 30th. We're right smack in the middle, more or less of 2010-11, between this year and next year, the governor is proposing flat funding, the same level of funding from one year to the next. Um, what that means in practical terms for a school district, this is, the, uh, this is what we're looking at in terms of per pupil funding over the course of the last five years. If you'll notice the last two bar, bar, I'm sorry, bar charts is that the, roughly speaking, if you adjust for inflation, K-12 schools would see about $120 reduction per student if the governor's package were to go through. That's adjusting for inflation. What it doesn't say is where you have been. 
If you look at 2007-8, California public schools were funded at approximately $8,700 per student. If the governor's tax package and all things are accepted, we would be funding schools at roughly $7,300 per student next year. That's a $1,500 per student cut. That is a very dramatic and large cut to schools, which is, I'm sure, many people in districts across the state are feeling that pain. This chart shows you what it would look like if the governor's package is not passed and we were to operate moving forward from this year to next under current law. What it shows is the last two, chart, last two bars are 2011-12, both of them. One shows a $49.3 billion funding level. The next shows a $47.3 billion funding level. That's a $2 billion cut. That translates into roughly $300 per student. Now, what this does not say is if the tax package is not passed and the legislature were to decide to spread the pain across all parts of the budget equally, it would mean a $5.6 billion cut to education or roughly a $930 hit per student. So what you're looking at is a, a, the governor is proposing basically flat funding for schools. The governor has not said exactly what will happen if his proposal is not taken. But it is clear that schools will experience a significant amount of pain if there is no tax package and an extension of these temporary taxes. What does this mean in terms of how California schools compare to other states in the nation? California has dropped, now there's a lot of different numbers that float around around this, but I'll try to explain it to you briefly. We have dropped from 35th in the nation in terms of per pupil spending to 47th in the nation in the last two years. That is without adjusting for regional cost differences. That's saying California and Alabama are judged equally against each other, even though we know it costs more to educate a student in the Bay Area than it does to educate a student in Birmingham, Alabama. So the issue here is, is that California is winning something. It's called the race to the bottom. We are winning a race to the bottom as relates to every other state in this nation. It, the other salient point here is, is that California's class sizes are the largest in the nation by 50% more than any other, than the national average. Now, how did we get in this mess in the first place? Why is it that we're sitting here talking about such huge budget problems? There are some major issues going on in California. The first and foremost is the economy tanked. We are in the Great Recession right now, or we are slowly coming out of it, theoretically. What this means is that there was major drop-offs in revenue for the state, Another reason is that there were major tax cuts over the course of the last 20 years given to lots of people in the state, but one of them being corporations. Uh, notice I call them a people. And then demographic changes. We have now in the, we have in the state of California the size of the city of Oakland coming into the state every year. Roughly about three or 400,000 people that arrive in the state of California every year. They demand social services just like everybody else. Um, and so what I'm going to show to kind of walk you through here really briefly is what was the lead up to the crisis that we're in. In 2007-8, the legislative analyst, which is the independent arm that provides information to the legislature, said that we were going to receive $41.5 billion more than we are going to receive next year. They were predicting four years ago. Well, what can we expect in terms of tax revenue? Four years ago, they said, well, we're going to get X. And what it turned out was that we got 40, we are likely to receive $41.5 billion less next year than the LAO predicted just four years ago. That is half of what the overall budget of the state of California is. So we have a major revenue problem in this state. In addition, we have a series of tax cuts over the last 20 years that have led to the state's coffers being depleted by monies not collected by the state. If the governor's tax package is not passed, next year the state of California will receive $13 billion less than it would have received had all those tax cuts not been passed. That is half of our budget problem right there. Where did these tax cuts go? A lot of them went to major corporations over the course of the last 20 years. So, there's another piece here. How many people answered corrections? Don't be embarrassed when I said what was the number one cost. Well, the reason that, that that's actually not so far off, what, what, what Mayor Kwan told us at the beginning of the presentation is absolutely true. It is the fastest growing portion of the budget. Correction spending has grown at four times general fund spending over the last 20 years. That's what that last bar shows. So, where, so what that means is we are spending more and more of our money 
on a certain portion of the budget. This is another portion of the budget that's grown dramatically. It's our debt service. We vote for, thing, we, we want things in the state and we pass bond initiatives for them. One of them, for instance, stem cell research. Another one, high speed rail. Another one, children's hospitals. Hey, I, I think these things are all great too. But when you pass them, you have to pay debt service on all the things that you're passing. That debt service has doubled in the last 10 years, from 3.5% of the budget to about 7% of the budget. Ooh. Oh, ooh. Okay. Now, California's tax system is part of the problem in this situation. We have a tax system that is antiquated. We base it on goods, not on services. We are taxing, we tax things that the growth in the economy is in services. Accounting, lawyers, psychologists, all the things that we, you know, landscaping, anything that we spend money that's a service, there's no sales tax on that. Oh, and by the way, how many people bought something on Amazon last, this past year? Really, that many? How many people filed their sales and use tax with the Franchise Tax Board to say that what, what it is that you actually purchased and you're going to pay your sales tax on that? You know what? We usually get at least one. There's only 8,000 people in the state that actually filed that form, so don't feel so bad. But that means that the state is losing dollars that it should be collecting in terms of sales tax. That's a big problem in terms of the state sales tax. And every dollar that the state doesn't collect is 40 cents that doesn't go to a school. So. Um, corporate income tax collections, uh, this is a chart that shows cor net corporate income. This is the left part of the chart. Net corporate income over the last 10 years has increased threefold. Net corporate tax payments, the liability of tax, the, the corporations ver as relates to what it is that they earn, has gone up 65%. So what that means is the companies are making lots and lots of money and they're only paying a certain amount in taxes. As it relates to the individuals in society, that would be you and me, um, total adjusted gross income, we've increased by about 16% over the last 10 years, but our personal tax liability has increased by 25%. So what this means is that we have a question of our priorities and how it is that we're ordering things and priorities. Now, this is the most controversial portion. I'm going to end the presentation on this issue. The most controversial portion of, this, of the governor's budget proposal has to do with redevelopment agencies. It is a very complicated issue and a very complicated proposal. Redevelopment agencies, though, in terms of what's happening at the state, is a, it's a subsidy to, to local redevelopment projects that then takes dollars away from cities, counties, and schools. What, it, what you're looking at here is a pie chart that shows where local property taxes went 30 years ago in 1977-78 versus 2007-8. That's the most recent data we have available. And you'll notice the biggest changes in this pie chart are in redevelopment, 2% of overall taxes that were collected. Local property taxes went to redevelopment agencies 30 years ago. 2007-8, 30 years later, it's 12%. That's six times growth. Those dollars are dollars that are not flowing to schools, fire districts, water districts. And what that means is that the state has to backfill the dollars that schools receive. This is the complicated part that's hard to explain, but basically, if the school doesn't get the money from local property taxes, the state comes in and fills in the rest. Well, that's, so the schools don't necessarily feel the pain so much on that, although it's more complicated than that. But when the state has a budget crisis and the state has to find dollars that it's spending, that means there's more pressure to get dollars away from schools than there would, like, than there would otherwise have been. Now, there's a lot of research out there as relates to redevelopment agencies, some of it done by redevelopment agencies themselves, some of it done by other organizations and redevelopment agents. But when we've, we've done the research, we've looked and we've said there's really no evidence to show that redevelopment as a, has actually increased economic activity or development in California. What it likely does is it shifts economic development from one place to another. For example, from Oakland to Emeryville, where there's major redevelopment. And what you find is, is that there is a transfer of wealth from one area to another. So I'm going to leave it with that. Um, I know I've rushed through a tremendous amount and a lot of complex information for you. I hope that it wasn't overwhelming. And I'd be happy to take questions afterwards if there's time for it. Now you know the facts. If you feel more informed, perhaps angrier, or just curious about what's going on with the budget, and you still feel you need to do additional research 
or find additional tools and resources to help influence the process and make a difference in education funding, please visit the OUSD website at www.ousd.k12.ca.us. Again, that's the Oakland Unified School District. You can type that into your search browser. It should be the first hit. Click right there to find out more about what's going on in Oakland Public Schools and with the state budget. Thank you.